Is my mic on? I can't tell if I'm... It looks like it's on. I think we're good. I checked the dongle. The dongle suggests that my mic is on. Maybe I better do this thing that I always do, where I open this link in a new window. Just getting started. This is early. This is the pre-show, remember? So it's only 9.46. Blow on the T. Uh, and I don't see the usual subtitles, but let's... Yeah, oh, no. Only oh, there it is. Blasting me right in the side of the ears. So it's working. Why isn't it giving me subtitles, though? That's weird. I want you to give me subtitles, Facebook. I like them. We'll figure that out. Maybe that means no one will watch. Apparently, um, people watch entire like 10, 10 minute length videos. So, hey, Ruth, nice to see you. Good morning. Good evening for you. Or good, good early evening. Apparently, people will watch live videos for like 10 minutes at a time just reading the subtitles. And that makes so much sense to me because when I'm scrolling, I, first of all, hate, I'm usually listening to music or something's going on. And if I have to listen to audio, then I have to like find the remote and I got to mute the TV or I have to like stop my music or good morning, LA. I have to do whatever. And so having subtitles is nice because I can just read it and get a sense really quickly rather than like, oh, what's going on? How much time do I have to spend? So I like getting subtitles and I like it when Facebook gives me awesome automatic subtitles. It doesn't look like it's doing that this morning. So we're out of luck. What can you do? You just got to sit here and take it with me or watch after the fact. Oh, well, some piping hot tea today. It's July 9th, one day before my mom's birthday. Happy birthday, Heather. Heather Daynard. Uh, what is she celebrating this year? I think this is her six, 71st birthday. 71st birthday for Heather Daynard. So happy birthday, mom, if you're watching or if you're catching this in uh, replay. We've got some good topics today. I want to check in with me first and let's see what um, what's uh, what's present in the old the old Adam head. What what sort of stuff's been going on? So this week is really the first week back fully from. I think this is the first week back. Maybe I should check. Oh, it looks like, yeah, this is the first week fully back into the structure of um, of my life, I suppose, my, my, my non-time off structure. So last Thursday, I was kind of like the first coming out. So last week, the way I usually transition out of my vacation time is the first week is usually I'm getting up, I, I start to get up earlier. So I tend to get up around eight o'clock when I'm on vacation, when I'm taking time off during those sabbatical months. The first week back, I usually get up around six and, and it's like I'm slowly putting in the, the bricks of the structure of the life that I live the rest of the time. And so this is the first full week back. And that means I'm getting up at 530 in the morning again. I got almost zero sleep last night for whatever reason, I couldn't fall asleep. So uh, yeah, getting up early in the morning again, um really experiencing um the benefit of being back in the saddle and it's felt like a super productive week and so some of what i've been doing um one of the things is that the forge ended in may forge is a big project of ours hopefully that's clear for anyone that that's sort of present to it it um it's kind of simple in concept but as it grows and as we have more and more people come and join and we're, we're trying to affect transformation and leadership on a larger scale, that that's more for us to own. We got to have our hands around more. And so um, we always get feedback. We, we sort of do a post-mortem for ourselves. How did this go? What could we do better? What's no longer working the way it, it, to do it the way we used to do it. And so it's kind of been, um, we finished in May and then there's been June where it's been waiting. People have been coming on board. They've been registering for this coming year. And it's we've been intentionally not putting our attention there. And you might be able to relate to this experience. As we've been doing that, it becomes bigger and bigger in our minds. You know, like, oh my God, what do we have to do? What do we make, need to make sure we get done? Are we missing something? Ah, there's so little time. It's gonna start so quick. Like all of that starts to happen. And this is what I, I notice happens for me when stuff exists only in my mind. So 
that could be like a to-do list. If I have a, a list of things I know I need to get done in my mind, it's kind of infinite. There's like an infinite, an infinity. And it's, I don't think it's an infinitesimal because that means infinitely small, maybe an infinitude of sort of like possibility and stuff I could do in my brain. And so when I've got stuff on my mind, I'm like, I need to get it done. I, uh, I'm not doing all the stuff I need to do. I'm failing as a human being and all of the other stuff that comes along for the ride. What often is very helpful for me is to put it into a finite format, which is like writing it down on a list. And then it's like, I can look at it and be like, okay, got it. There's seven things I need to do. It turns out maybe some offshoots or some other stuff there, but like, that's all there is that I need to get done. And so this week was the first, um, what we did in previous years is the forge would finish. June came, we'd rest, we'd relax. July and August, we, we didn't, it was on our minds, but most of our attention would be on enrollment. Hello, people joining. Uh, our attention would be on enrollment, not so much like what was next, because up to this point, um, we could kind of, winging it's too casual. We're much more intentional than that, but we could do that a little bit. We could kind of like, okay, we'll meet it as it shows up and we'll do what there is to do. And this year that's clearly like we've taken an exponential leap. The size overall of the cohorts almost double, not literally because almost half of those people are on the leadership track. So they're, they've already gone through one. So it's, it's not quite the same energy as taking on 20 new people versus 10, but nevertheless, size of the cohorts nearly doubled. And so this year we're like, oh, that's that way we did in the past won't work. We have to really take this on. So this week was the first of a number of, well, all of the remaining weeks until we start in September where we've got two hours every week sit, set aside to like, okay, what needs to get handled? What do we need to look at? So we sat down together and we were like, okay, let's get everything in our brains out on paper. What's all the stuff that's on our mind about this? And we got all that down and then we started to move through it. So we're like, okay, we've got to nail down dates. Let's do that. Okay, we've got to confirm everything. Let's do that. Okay, we've got to get our hands around the retreat. Let's do that. Okay, blah, blah, blah. So that's, especially with a partner and one who I'm romantically involved with, that's not necessarily always the easiest um, task. Part of the reason for that is because um, Bay and I are humans and we both have our triggers. And so as we're working through some of this stuff, those triggers can get poked. Those buttons can get pushed. Not because either of us is being uncaring or inconsiderate of one another, just because your buttons get pushed no matter what, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So for example, um, scheduling is often experienced as quite stressful for Bay. And I think, and I believe she'd say the same thing, that's a product of growing up where um, you were one always late and you were always like a bad person for being late and everything was like a panicked rush to the next thing. That was kind of like the environment she was raised in, the way she was raised. That was the way of being she grew up from and to some extent into. She's done a tremendous amount of work and, and taken humongous strides beyond that. So it's not, that's not her daily life. Although it kind of was when we first started dating. By the way, she could point to all this sort of stuff from me. So I want to be clear. This isn't like Adam's on a pedestal and Bay's not. It's not at all the case. It's just I can see over there a lot more easy than I can see back here where my stuff lies. So as we're sitting down and starting to schedule, part of like those old buttons can get pushed for Bay where it's like we're trying to schedule something and then it's not clear. Like, wait a sec, why are we doing this? And then, you know, like she could start to get a little... um contracted. And then from her contraction, I can start to be like, just let me do it. Like I can start to contract and be like, just fucking give it to me and I'll solve this. Like, why do we have to go through this? So on and so forth. So a lot of that work is, you know, being really as loving as we can with each other and trying to find the way to partner in the midst of us, like just doing the natural contraction and then ex opening back up that happens in relationship with humans. What we want to do our best to avoid and I think this is collective in relationship is this where one person contracts and then the other person in reaction contracts. And then we're both like that. And then you have two fists punching each other. That's, that's the fighting that happens. So this is a bit of a model for what happens everywhere in the world is when someone shows up and does something to you that you experience as rude or mean or whatever, I would assert that's coming from their contraction. They contract around their heart 
And then when we're contracted around our heart, it's harder for us to, to be loving. It's harder for us to re both receive and offer love into the world. So it's harder to come from a place of love. And conse consequently, we tend to come from a place of callousness or coldness or selfishness or, you know, all of these places that are really the product of a contracted heart. And when we do that, when you're on the receiving end of someone's callousness or selfishness or coldness or whatever, cruelty, et cetera, et cetera, their, their shadow, your tendency is like, fuck you. <laughs> Why should I put up with your bullshit? And we close too. Now I want to be, I, I'm going to distinguish here something to come back to, which is to say that doesn't mean you have to hang out with them and be all lovey and receive their bullshit or their coldness or the callousness. That's not what we're saying. But that is distinct from the opportunity in these moments is, is for us to, to do the hard work to like release our contraction so that we can stay open. And if you can do that, especially around the people that you care about, but aspirationally around everyone in the world, that will provide the space for them to contract or to expand. And then they can open back up. And then we can kind of be like, hey, fuck, I'm sorry. I, I really came at you there. And what was going on was I was really, I was upset about this. Then we can start to own what's happening in a lot truer way, as opposed to from this place, what we can own is nothing other than the fact that you fucked up. Whereas once we can open, open up, we can sort of take a look on our side and all of that beautiful stuff starts to happen. Um, as I'm sharing this, put your name in over there on the, on that side, put put your name down there. Let me know who's watching. I'm going to say hi to you. I want to give you a shout out. You want a shout out, right? Now, so contraction comes at you. Ah, doesn't feel good. And then the human, the natural default human tendency is we contract too. We punch each other, we bounce off. We karam away like two billiard balls hitting each other and flying up to other ends of the pool table. Hey, Kristen. Hello, Souk. Boy, your your neck of the island is really growing, hey? We drove out, well, we spent some time there a couple of weekends ago, and it was like, holy mackerel, there was so much development happening here. Kind of the case for everywhere on this, this island we live on. A lot of people want to live here. I don't blame them. Uh, I do hope we don't deforest our beautiful land, though, and that we honor all of the people that live on it and that once lived on it. So the... This is the, the sort of experience, the default. And what I'm advocating for is the opportunity in those moments for you to stay open-hearted. Now, what a lot of people then take that to mean, hey, Adam, nice to have you with us, man. What a lot of people take that to mean is, oh, got it. So even if someone comes at me like a fuck bag, is that a thing? Seems like a thing. I should stay open and hang out with them. No. That's not at all what we're saying. So the importance of your own boundaries, your own sovereignty, and recognizing what you are a yes to and what you are not a yes to is really important. But the way most of us assert our boundaries is like this. This person shows up this, we close, and then we're like, fuck you boundaries, and we walk away. The opportunity I'm inviting is even if you are asserting your boundaries, even if you are deciding to, to leave, who you are practicing being internally is open and expansive even in the face of someone being a jerk. You, you doesn't mean you have to hang out with them. It doesn't mean you have to like do anything really. All that I'm pointing to is the opportunity available for us to be the ones to practice staying open. And the reason we'd practice that opportunity is because then we get to live our life more open, more expanded, even when we run into those people who are contracted because this requires a lot of energy. And it means that there's not a lot of love that can get in and there's not a lot of love that can come out. We can't experience much love in our life much openness, much possibility when we're contracted. So one, as you take on this practice of really working through something and holding it internally, you get a different experience of life. And as an added benefit of you getting more of that experience in your life, other people are gonna have more space for them to do their own opening. Don't do it for them. <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> Not really, but like, don't do it for them. Do it for you. Do it for the experience of your life. Hey, Katie, nice to see you. The experience of your life that this will provide and just notice and recognize in the background that as you as you live your life as you practice opening into your own life this way other people will start to be more open and the beautiful thing about that in kind of a, a karmic kind of way 
is that you're going to start to notice less people like this because in your presence, people will close less because you are more open. So openness or put differently, like love can always win. Hate or closure or contraction pulls, it's got a gravity to it. It pulls us in. But if you can do the hard work and it is hard work, it requires effort to stay open in the space of that, it will invite other people to open. And that provides a more expansive world, a more loving world, world with more possibility. I love you. Thank you, Katie. I really, um, I take your acknowledgement. Um, I hold it in high regard and I appreciate that. And you. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's get to some of these topics. Um, we've had some generous topic suggestions from David Medina, my man, David, from Brita Long. Brita, not Brita, she tells me. It's like Rita with a B, Brita Long and Andrew Mundy. So um, I've not looked at any of these. I just got the topics and was like, great, let's work with this live. Let's see what gets created. So uh, I think we'll start with breakthroughs around money because that one's a little more sharing some of what we've created in our lives. And then um, and then I think we're going to shift into getting supported when nothing needs to be fixed. So David asks um, on the last live last week, last live show, I was sharing that really the place Bay and I are focused in terms of um, our, I guess you could call it our energy is not money. We're not really concerned about um, making money and uh, amassing wealth. That's not really in our, our focus anymore. It's having a bigger impact to support more of the world and getting the gift of transformation and openness and open heartedness and all of that sort of stuff. So uh, David was saying like, hey, you know, I'm curious, Adam, what was the breakthrough and the things that you worked on such that you guys don't have to worry about money and that this is taken care of? What systems have you put into place that are an expression and result of your relationship to money in regards to investing, savings, clients? Uh, so, yes, I'm happy to share those. Uh, first, I want to share like the the way money was growing up and then the way I learned to be with money. So growing up, uh, both my parents are very, I think frugal is probably a good term for it. Like not miserly, but very uh, like responsible with responsibility on top of responsible. So it's like two layers of responsibility. And so the stories I kind of grew into, the, the inherited stories about money for me were um, we don't have to worry about it but be very, very responsible about it. So like, I didn't have to live in fear that we were gonna, you know, not have a house or we were gonna find ourselves on the street. But at the same time, I kind of lived in fear of spending it. So like, be very thoughtful and cautious about spending the money that we have, which is kind of a, even in that, hopefully you can see there's like an interesting, uh, like, uh, polarization between those two, like, okay, we don't have to worry about it. But then at the same time, we have to be very like hyper vigilant about how we spend it. And so my parents from love and doing what had worked best for them tried to imbue in my brother and I like really um, responsible, like think a lot about money, blah, 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 blah. And they didn't even necessarily sit us down and say, here's what you need to know. Although I think they probably did at some point, but like that was just who they beat about it. And so that's who we learned to be about it. And so from that, I would say my brother kind of followed in their track. He's very responsible, a lot of attention on money, very clear about where it is, probably a much better budgeter than I am. And for me, the way it worked is that I would kind of move back and forth between the two poles that I had just described in that, like, uh, don't have to worry about money, but be very cautious about spending money. And so the way that played out in, in life was that on some level, I always knew that there would be enough money because that just happened to be the way it worked out. And I don't mean that in a sense like, thank you, universe, you magically gave me the right amount of money. I mean that somewhere intuitively, I just like below the level of my consciousness would adjust my life in accordance to match whatever level of income I was creating. 
So when I was working at McDonald's, when I was young, I lived, my lifestyle matched that. And then as I got a better job, my lifestyle matched that, you know, maybe I was busing tables at busy restaurant during summer, which earned me a bunch of money. So then better lifestyle. And then, oh, we're back to school now. I have less money, lower lifestyle. So there was this natural balance that happened. And inside that balance, that was just ongoing. I would fluctuate between kind of being carefree and whatever, it's all good. I'm not so worried about money. And then I'd kind of get fed up because it's like, ah, but I'm stuck at this level. Like I can't seem to get above it. I can't seem to rise out of it. And there was always like this dread. Dread's a strong word, but it was more like an anxiety that just hung out back here that was like, hey, but how much do you have enough money? Is it going to be okay? So even though on some level, intuitively, I'm saying I kind of trusted or lived as though there would be enough, from this pattern, there was just this anxiety that hung out back here that was just every now and then tapping me on the shoulder. Hey, when you check your bank account, how much is going to be there? Is that visa bill going to be really high? So that was one side of how money occurred for me, how my relationship with money occurred. The other side was then I would go from that I reach a point where I was like, you probably know this point, like for great justice, I am going to change the way it goes. And then I would go all the way to the other pole where I got hyper vigilant about budgeting and I'd make a new, a better budget spreadsheet. And I would rigidly follow it for two, three months. Hey, Andrew, thank you. I like this too. It's cashmere. I've never owned a cashmere anything. I don't think it's very soft, uh, but it requires shaving. I've learned. So I just, I have, we have a clothing shaver and I just shaved off the pilling that happened. So anyhow, it's not really part of the story. So, um, from cavalier kind of casual, no bigs, there's enough money to like, okay, we got to get down and get serious and get real. And what the, 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 the pattern, the trend for the way I would be about money was like this. It was very like up, down, up, down. It was very cyclical, like a sine wave. Go up to down, to up, to down. That's a sine wave, by the way. A sine wave just goes from up up to one. You know, if you've got an X and a Y axis, it goes all the way up to one, then it goes down to negative one. Then it goes up to one and then down to negative one. Very simple wave, the simplest of waves. So um, what happened here is that this worked to a point. It worked to get us to the point where I wanted to actually become a coach. And I actually wanted to invest a lot of money in the training that I saw to take, as opposed to the little bit of money that I could scrounge up inside this existing model. So this model I've just described where, you know, there's always kind of enough and then I get hypervigilant and what, what have you, that, way of being about money had enough room for me to make small investments in certain things in my life. Like when I first thought while I was in law school, I could, I could get a loan from my parents or a student loan or whatever. I I went with my parents. They were like, borrow from us. It makes more sense than borrowing from a bank because then the interest stays in the family, but you know, you're paying this back. And then, um, so I could, I could get a loan for something like that, but for something that was outside of what was reasonable in my world, that wasn't available. Let me try to elaborate on what I mean. When I first was at law school and thought, maybe I want to be a coach. Ridiculous idea. What the hell is Adam talking about? So the training that I started to take initially was like $2,200. Not a lot of money. That was available inside this pattern. The way that money went for me, $2,200 wasn't going to break my bank it didn't require, like it was, it fit within the parameters that were available to me. The amount of possibility that my relationship to money allowed, allowed for that. But then I did that and it, coaching was boring and surface level and about entirely about goals. And and like, I didn't even know what a breakthrough was and frankly, didn't even believe they could happen. And so I was like, there's got to be something else. Like I'm going to give this at least one more go. And I found this program that I, later on, you've heard me talk about leading. And that program cost 20,000 US. At a time when I was six figure, Bay and I were six figures into debt because of my law degree, her MBA. So there was no, there's no room in this way that money went for me to allow for that. 
it, it just didn't have space for that. Like there was no point where I was going to amass 20,000 extra dollars the US, which is like 10 billion Canadian over like in any kind of reasonable period of time, you know, maybe over 10 years, but I didn't want to wait 10 years. There was a possibility available to me that I wanted now. I didn't want to spend 10 years working as a lawyer. And, and I was pretty certain like somewhere in my, somewhere my soul was saying, don't do that. Do not spend 10 years. My head was like, spend 10 years. It makes sense, Adam, just do it. You can set aside a little bit of money, blah, blah, blah. But my soul was like, don't, that's the wrong path. Do this thing that's terrifying. And so the other thing I want to share here is that 10 years was possible inside this context, this relationship for money I had, because the way I would be about money allowed for me to save up a thousand, maybe two thousand dollars a year, maybe a little bit more if I really white knuckled. But of course, it would just be a matter of time. And the extent to which I white knuckled would be matched by the extent to which I would get reckless for a period of time. So even I would try to like oh, really white knuckle and, and force myself to think heavily about money, it was just a matter of time before the pendulum swung back. And the more I tried to hold the pendulum out here, the more compensatory energy there was for that swing backwards. So I couldn't really get out of it. It was like, you're going to wait 10 years. That's the way it's going to be. And so this is the point where I was like, I had to enroll myself in this crazy idea of borrowing money from the equity in our house, our condo at the time, which was insane. And no one thought that was wise. And everyone tried to convince me not to. And they weren't trying to convince me not to because they were stupid idiots. They couldn't see possibility. They were trying to convince me not to because they loved me and they couldn't see that possibility and they were trying to save me from the potential heartbreak and failure so they're doing it out of love not out of a capacity to see the possibility that i was choosing into and frankly it was hard for me to see that so i can't really hold them to blame for that so that choice existed entirely outside of this relationship to money that i had there was there's no capacity for it that choice was actually a failure because then what that said was, first of all, that's not being very careful and responsible and smart and super cautious about how you're spending money for a whole variety of reasons. You're trained to be a lawyer. Why are you going to this stupid flaky coaching thing? That money is stored in your house. You never spend that. You leave that. That's your retirement plan, if nothing else. Like that's the way you make money. All of these smart rules about how you do and don't spend money that were a part of my context. And second, doing that meant based on how money would go for me, I would, we'd be paying that back over the next 10 years. And it's like, Jesus, that's all of the interest on that. Like that loan is actually going to turn out to be like 30,000 or even 40,000. Like that is a stupid way to spend your money. So what was happening here is I, all of what I just described to you was my existing relationship to money. And with the support of coaches standing for my possibility rather than standing for me not to have my heart broken i made a decision i took an action outside of this initial possibility of this this context i took an action that didn't really fit inside the existing paradigm for money and how i beat about it that was the start that was the first step so now i'm living into a new possibility doesn't end there though because then what happened was now I got to create a new relationship to money that actually allows for things to go differently. And so for a while, it was kind of bumpy and we made this step. And then that money, that loan we took just sat there. We didn't start to pay it down. We didn't really do much with it. It exactly as the existing relationship allowed for, it just sat and it grew in size over time. Not by a lot. The interest rate was fairly low. You can get banks love to like take loans secured by your house from you. So they'll offer you a very low interest rate. So we had that opportunity. So the money kind of just sat there like a hole in our account. And then when Bay wanted to do the same work a year later, hadn't really yet fully broken up this relationship to money. And so she did that. And so what happened was we kind of kept doing things like that. And then simultaneous to that, we had borrowed all this money from my parents to pay for law school and base MBA. And we had an obligation to pay them back to make payments on this. 
we were broke as F because we were trying to start businesses. And hey, Rachel, we were trying to start businesses. We were bootstrapping ourselves. We were learning a new skill. It was the first couple of years. You know, we didn't have an expectation that we would make a lot of money. And we were living accordingly. So we were living very frugally, but at the same time, we had these loans to my parents that they wanted us to repay. They wanted us to really honor the debt that we'd incurred and honor like this agreement between us that existed. Like, hey, we're gonna lend you this money, but we have an expectation you're gonna pay us back. And so I'm kind of speeding through some stuff here, but over a couple of years, what happened is I was very, I was very uh, haphazard about paying to them. Like I would forget about it. It just wasn't top of mind for me. And it came this point where we wanted to borrow more money because there was a group of coaches that was being formed <clears throat> and we wanted to be a part of it. And we felt it was really important. At this point, we'd gotten a little bit better at trusting that voice inside, that intuitive part of ourselves. And we were like, ah, we, I think we need to be a part of this group, but I had a very high price tag. It's about a, another $20,000. So we're going from 40K US plus whatever the, invet, the interest has been, plus the VIG to another 40K on top of that home. Our home is getting smaller in terms of our ownership of it. And so we went to my parents again to see like, hey, can we borrow more money? And they're like, no, you know, we lent you this money for your degrees. We lent you this money and, and to be clear, like they were very generous in lending us this money and we were very fortunate that they could do so. They're like, pay that back. Then we can talk about it. And so we're like, okay, got it. And we shared with them that notwithstanding that we were committed to doing this. We really felt this was important. And um, so on the one hand, that was a bit triggering, I think, for my parents because they couldn't see much possibility in coaching because it seemed flaky to them. It seemed like, what is going on? They're just throwing their lives away. On the other hand, or maybe along the same hand with another hand beside it, we were talking about borrowing even more money and not making any payments to their the, the amount of money we owed them. So this all landed very like, very irresponsible for them. And I can totally own it was. You know, I, I wasn't honoring an agreement there. And I was being kind of, it was that same kind of relationship to money where it was quite cavalier, quite flaky, whatever, you know, we're going to pay down eventually. And then of course I would get like budget conscious and super significant about money. And then I'd pay them a bunch on time and I'd swing back out, I'd keep going. And so eventually my mom and I went for coffee and she, she, she said like, you know, I, I, she shared the impact of who I was being with my money with her. So she shared, you know, like dad and I feel really like you're being irresponsible and like you're, you know, we wanna honor the path you're on, but at the same time, it feels like you're taking advantage of us. Like we've lent you this money, but there's kind of an expectation here that you're gonna pay it back. And then you're, you're borrowing even more money and we're worried about your financial livelihood and, you know, all of this stuff. And after she'd shared that, I kind of shared like um, my own relationship to money. And I shared like, you know, I've, I've often felt shame in our family and I don't want to put this on you guys, but like, I felt like I'm the reckless one, you know, like Brendan's really good with money and it feels like he's kind of taken after you guys really well. Whereas I feel like I, at least in this regard, I don't feel this way everywhere in, in our family, but like in this regard, I feel kind of like just the black sheep, the guy can't get it straight. And I have a lot of shame and embarrassment around that. And I'm really grateful that you brought this to me. And, and I want you to know, Bay and I are really committed to creating a breakthrough in this area and that we're working on it. And, um, you know, so basically just shared what was real for me and owned all of the impact of how this went. This is an example of cleaning up a mess. It's not that I intentionally caused that mess with, I didn't, I, I wasn't even thinking about it, right? It was in my blind spot in the sense that just wasn't where I looked. And when someone brings this to our attention, our the work I believe is to first just honor that there's been an impact on them, regardless of whether it's fair, right, just whatever. And two, own our part in creating that impact. And, and three, 
own what we can see there really there really is for us to take on regardless of the impact so there's kind of like you know acknowledge an impact completely honor and clean up the fact like how that landed on someone and then three take a look to see what there is for us to actually take on those two things can be a bit separate i'm going to leave that off for now so from there <laughs> That's all the pre the prefacing, but I think that's important because it gives you the full context as opposed to the like sexy soundbite where I'm like, I did these three things and now I'm a billionaire. Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck you, billionaire. You're totally unrelatable. So now we can go to like what there was to do from there. But it's important here that I point out that like, I don't know that that breakthrough would have become fully available to me if not for a willingness on my mom's part to bring that conversation and a willingness on my part to listen and be in that conversation with her. So like she was the catalyst. Now the good news is the universe is just going to keep giving me catalysts. As I continued down this pattern, I was going to keep leaving a wake behind me in the shape of my blind spot. And there would be more and more people willing to slap me in the head or to bring something to me. Good thing it was my mom. She's very loving. She sees the highest good in me and is very like uh, generous and gracious about this sort of thing. So thank you, universe, for letting that be the catalyst. But just to be clear that it, if, if not for my mom, the universe and the way that our karma kind of works is we're just going to keep getting more people because we're going to keep affecting the same behavior into the world. And the world's going to keep responding to it accordingly. So... What happened is then we came back and I sat down with my coach, Rachel, who's put a little smiley emoji there in the in the in the chat. And I um, got really clear, like, what what do I want this breakthrough to look like? And for me, the core of that was that, especially as an entrepreneur, money may ebb and flow. It may go up and it may go down. The first thing that I want to create in terms of my relationship with money is that I'm consistent whether or not my money is consistent. The way I had been prior to this was that money goes up and so do I. Money goes down and so do I. So as money rose, so too did my lifestyle. As money rose, I would start to save more. And then as money fell, I would save less and my lifestyle would diminish. I didn't wanna do that anymore. That was me being at the effect of money. And so instead, Part of this vision was I want to be consistent. I, I want to be consistent about money, regardless of how much money there happens to be. Two, I really wanted to create the possibility that like when opportunity came along, I could say yes to it. Bay and I could say yes to it. So that it didn't have to be like living a life constantly along that one pendulum swing where I'm just like, well, the budget says, so there's no possibility unless the budget, you know, just living in a prison. And then three, I really wanted to, um, I'm trying to think of the third part. I wanted to be really, um, what felt like fiscally responsible. So I, I kind of wanted it all. I wanted me to be consistent. I wanted the possibility of saying yes to big, scary things. And I wanted to be fiscally responsible as time went on. And so that was the initial vision. And then under there, we could start to fill out like, okay, what were the, what were the things to do? What would How would that look like in practice? And so some of the practices for, for me and really for us were, were setting aside money every single month for all the places that money needs to be set aside. So like home repairs, short-term savings, vacation savings, spending money for us because we want to be able to have some fun money. Uh, what other stuff? Oh, payments towards income tax, like interim payments to income tax. So they won't get this big wad of money we owe at the end of the year and go fuck and then lose our consistency. So all of that stuff consistently, regardless of how much money was coming in, we were doing that. Two, um, commitment to like pay, included in that, I guess, was like paying my parents back, like making those payments. Um, Three was setting aside more money. Oh, oh, that's what three was. Three was like every single morning for probably about two years, logging into my bank first thing, reviewing all of the purchases, making sure the visas were zeroed out. That's one thing I was really reliable for anyhow, but also checking with Bay. Hey, what's this expenditure? What's this expenditure? Did you pay this off? Did you move your spending money to our visa when you made this purchase? 
Because what tended to happen was because of the swing, there'd be like a month where I was great about that. And then there'd be a month where I just wasn't checking that stuff. And during that month where I wasn't checking stuff like that, we just missed a bunch of stuff. We weren't even aware that our lifestyle was rising up. So I didn't have any kind of thermometer to measure like, hey, Adam, are you still being consistent? Not just from my actions, but from looking at the evidence in my bank account and on my visa statement. So that was the other thing we were doing. I would log in every morning, I check those. And I started using a program called Mint, which is similar to Intuit or QuickBooks or any of these online things, which allowed you to categorize your expenses. And so I had budget set up for all of those, which was really just a number thermometer for me. And we would look like, hey, how are we doing on restaurant spending? How are we doing on this? What about gifts? What about this? Are we spending a lot in this way? And it just allowed us to temper ourselves, to get to that point of consistency. It didn't mean if we had bought like a bunch of patio furniture one month, it didn't mean we had to stop and couldn't buy anymore. It meant we needed to wait till the next month and then till the next month. And to be clear, Bay and I like treats. It's fun to get treats. It's fun to get new stuff. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying consumerism is a healthy thing for our planet. I'm just acknowledging the human part of us that does enjoy getting a treat. This is why consumerism kind of works. It's why we still go for it. So we have to acknowledge that truth, I think. So we do like that stuff. We're not shutting that out completely. We're just tempering that. And by having our eyes on this in a consistent way, it served us to start to become more consistent. So from there, and then I'm gonna come back to what you've written, Andrew. Thanks for your comments. That was about probably two years. And a couple of things happened over those years. First of all, the money in our bank rose dramatically, probably for a few reasons. We started getting hired at higher rates and you could say like, well, that's not related to the money stuff you were doing. But I would assert that because of who we were being about money, we had a greater capacity to hold space for other people to invest more powerfully in their own lives. We had a greater capacity to support other people to be more transformed about their relationship to money and then consequently to do things that were more courageous and so on and so forth. So I, the way I hold it is it's all holistic. You make the changes here and then over time, the world will respond to you. So the money in our bank started to rise. We also were spending less. And as the money in our bank rose and the income did, our lifestyle did not. Maybe a little bit. We'd sort of give ourselves treat money and stuff like that when brought on a new client or something. But we didn't suddenly start buying swimming pools for our backyard or anything like that. And so from that place, our lifestyle, for the most part, has stayed fairly consistent. Like if you came to our place, you wouldn't see us you'd see a lot of shoes in Bay's office and you'd see a lot of nice bottles of alcohol in the pub that, that we have here, but you wouldn't see swimming pools and Ferraris, not that we could afford them, but like our lifestyle has not changed that grandly because we're really committed to that consistency. So these days I don't check the bank account that with that level of rigor. I don't, um, I don't zero the visa out every single day with the same sort of like, every single day kind of mentality I did because that stuff started to become ingrained, both because it's become a bit habitual, but because the way of being that I was creating from that breakthrough is now a part of who I be about money. So it's not something I have to force into the world. I'm just a lot more aligned naturally in how I show up. And so when I do check, I'm like, hey, I'm pretty much on track because it's now kind of intuitively there. It's the same thing for like um, a lot of the work I was doing around my nutrition and creating a breakthrough there for about a year and a half. I was tracking everything I ate every single day. It's really helpful and really enlightening. But these days I don't really track it because I just have it. You know, it's it's become the way I live my life. And when I do track it, I'll sometimes I'll just like, let's just see how we're doing. And I'm like, wow, right on the money for the amount of like macro, whatever macronutrients. Like there's the carbs, fat and protein all sort of worked out. So there comes a time where you'll have created the breakthrough and then you can choose whether or not to keep doing that stuff. So that's how, David, to your question, that's how that money breakthrough got created for us is um, the messiness that kind of worked. And then like the, the 
hard conversations to sit in, starting to take actions outside of the context, actions that weren't allowed inside that context. So basically stepping into a new possibility and then creating the breakthrough as I was stepping into that new possibility. The alternative here that could have happened would be that I step into that new, that breakthrough, I take the breakthrough action. I'm like, all right, I'm going to make this insane investment and pull equity from our home and do all this crazy stuff that everyone knows I shouldn't and then not change at all and then just live with debt like that. I'm pleased to share. We don't, we don't have any debt. Um, we have a mortgage and that's the extent of our debt. Oh, I guess we have a car loan. Um, and I will share that my parents uh, for a birthday present forgave a large chunk of our student loan. But the cool thing was at that point, we, we had like created enough income that we could pay it off anyhow. So that was like, we were ready to do that because we we're like, great, we can, we can do this. And they're like, we're going to do this for you. Um, so we were very, again, very fortunate in that. But I want to be clear that the breakthrough was not contingent on them doing anything like that. If they said, hey, actually, we decided we're going to charge you interest, we were like, great, we had the room for it because our context had expanded to allow for even that possibility. Okay, so Andrew, you say this relationship to money is one that I've grown in for myself, but still have a lot of struggles in supporting prospective clients to see the value of the investment outside of the financials. That's the that's the hard work of coaching, right? Because our head is designed to manage risk and money is the ultimate risk management tool. It's also the ultimate conduit for possibility, but if we're in a risk management state, then money becomes a tool for mitigating and dealing with risk. And so, of course, then the plan becomes, you know, if the context someone's living in in their life is life is risky and I must manage that, the game becomes a mass money. So if I can get enough money, I can deal with whatever problem shows up. I'm not going to find myself homeless. I'm not going to be fucked. I'm not going to have everyone move forward on this race. And I'm stuck I, like I screwed up. And so now for the rest of my life, I'll be forever behind them. So that's how people relate to money. And then from there, of course, like from inside that context, all that they can really think about when you invite them into a conversation about like, hey, are you interested in coaching is sure, will it make me more money? Will this help me get better at the game I'm currently playing? That's not the conscious thinking, but that's ultimately what what is happening. Like, well, the game I'm playing is I need to get enough money to feel safe in my life. Sure, coach, can you help me get more money? Because then I'll feel safer in my life. And then eventually I'll feel so safe that I won't have to worry about feeling safe ever again. Uh, uh, I'd like to talk to you about that belief, but that's kind of what's going on. And so often when people have objections about money, the work for us is to really get it, really understand it, to really receive it in such a way that it makes complete sense. We drop our position and get fully over there with them. And then once we've given them the experience that we really get them, ask them if they're interested in a conversation that might expand some of their possibility, like might grow things a bit. And then what we want to do is help them see the way it goes with money. That that pattern I described for myself. So they can see that like, yeah, I could, I would probably say no to this because it's not going to make me any money. Great. And then what's going to happen? Well, then blah, 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 and then so on and so forth. And at the heart of all of this stuff, it's never really about the money. Almost never is any of this stuff really about the money. It's about our fears about who we are, or who we are not, inability to trust ourselves. that sort of stuff is really what's at play. Andrew, happy to, happy to provide. He says, I always find it fascinating to hear about your journey to this point. Happy to oblige. And then Andrew's kind of context or mentality around money was, how can I do things the cheapest? How can I find the deal? And just saying it didn't really work well when it came to actually getting deeper levels of support at the beginning of this journey. Totally. The um, One of the things that I find fascinating about our relationship to money is that it allows for two extremes that occur in the moment very differently to us, but are actually just the two sides of the same coin. So the easiest way to see this in money is when people are raised with the belief, if you want to work hard, you better make a lot of money. No, sorry. <laughs> Scratch that. If you want to make a lot of money, you better work hard. And from that belief, there's two ways that people tend to show up in their lives. One is, well, I want to make a lot of money, 
So they go and find places that reward them for working hard with a lot of money. So you find people in law, you find accountants, uh, like CEOs, you know, executive leaders. A lot of my people have this kind of thing where we've we found places in the world that align with that belief and reward us in accordance with that belief. You're working hard, so here's a bucket of money. The other place people can end up is the opposite of that, which is I so remember the belief is if if you want a lot of money, you better work hard. So the other side of that is people are like, I don't want to work hard. I'm not interested in working hard. These people look miserable. They got a bunch of money, but they look unhappy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out they they're still inside the confines of this belief. They conclude, well, I don't want to work hard, which means I'm not going to have a lot of money. So how can I live a beautiful, great, fulfilling life without a lot of money? So then they learn how to create exactly that. So in the first coaching training program I, I took, I remember there was this woman I kept in touch with for quite some time, and she was magnificent at this. She, she took vacation. She found places to travel all through Europe on like a shoestring budget, but she never had any money of her own. This is not a criticism of her. It's just to notice that it's still operating inside of that same context, that same box. It's just the other side of that coin. And it's if that life in and of itself is, is exactly what that woman wants, great, way to go. You've created something. But there's a limited degree of possibility available inside that belief. It's a limited construct. And what that limits is from there, she can never, unless she can find the deal, she can't make the purchase. Her ability to be a conduit for money is drastically limited because she's always almost allergic to money because that would mean she'd have to work hard and she doesn't want to do that. If I have a lot of money, if I'm making a lot of money, that's going to impact on my peace and happiness and joy. Therefore, no, which is totally fine. But for me, money is a conduit of like, I'm not talking about holding money. I'm talking about money like a flow. As I bring money in and then put it back out into the world, that's like a conduct, a conduit of um, like a flow of prosperity and productivity and growth and stuff like that. I think money at its highest form of good is when it's flowing from individual to individual to individual. When it starts to amass in pools, it becomes toxic. That's not how money is. It's like if we gathered all the water and held it in one place. That's not the way water does its best work. Water works by evaporating and then raining down over the land and then flowing down rivers and then you know creating um currents that move our hydroelectric stuff and that we can gain power from like that's where water's at its finest if we just sequestered all the water in the world in a vault we are not used that is that is not how water works and money is very similar and so for that friend of mine she just can't be much of a conduit for money she can't stand very well for people in her practice to make that kind of investment, to make a high investment for money uh, into their own coaching. It's not to say she's wrong for any of us. It's just so I, I'm just intending to showcase one, how whatever our, our box, there's kind of two poles on either side that occur different, but are actually the same. And two, that while there's nothing wrong with any particular belief, notice that it allows for some things to be possible and other things not to be possible. Hi, uh, yeah, Rachel, thanks for being on this journey with me. It's been quite a ride. Funny, it feels like a long time since we talked about money. Um, Andrew, you say being able to go deeper with these conversations around money is an area you're growing in. And uh, it's like you say, in really getting clear on how they see things. I'll be honest, it's an area that I often get hung up on, but I'm going to keep working through it. It's beautiful work, Andrew. That's the, you know, like the more we can equanimously and never, Equanimity is the word, but the, I don't know, active verb is equanimously, which is weird, sounds weird to me. But anyhow, the more equanimously we can allow people, just receive how things are for them without needing them to be any different, without needing to fix it, without needing them to reframe it or anything, just to really get it, the more space that person has to be themselves. And the more space they have to be themselves, the more space they have for transformation to come forward. It's only taken me like a decade to really get clear on that. 
Okay, so that's money. We're gonna draw that to a close uh, as a fun trip. Thank you, David, for that fantastic question. Let's go to, what did I say we're gonna go to? Getting supported when nothing needs to be fixed. I guess this is another David. Maybe we should go to someone else. Let's go to you, what you asked, Andrew. So Andrew said, how do you keep things fun and exciting when you've set targets for your business and you aren't on track? I find that I'm continually missing these targets that seem reasonable. In the end, I feel like, what's the point? Excuse me. I'm already in tons of action. Why set targets at all? Super relatable for me. So let's create some languaging and then we'll talk about how this works. And this is really what I was describing is a common issue on all teams aiming to perform and create some kind of result outside of what they're already reliable to do. So this is much more than just an individual conversation. This is also an organizational conversation, personal conversation, anything you're in partnership, anything you're trying to do that is a result greater than what you are already predictable and reliable to create. So first we're gonna talk just about a declaration and a declaration is you saying, I am going to do this by this date, X by when, what? By when? There's power in a declaration, which is why we resist it. So you'll notice, especially if you're in a conversation with me or like any of these awesome people that are commenting on the sidebar that are coaches, there's this annoying thing we'll do where you're like, you know what? It's time for this to stop. I'm gonna start making courageous choices. And then we'll be like, Great, how? And then you're like, I, I don't know. I'm like, I'm just gonna, when I feel like I'm not being courageous, I'm gonna do this. Great, what will that look like? So we're trying to get you clear on your what. What is the actual thing you're gonna do? To the point where it's like a child could then tell us whether or not you did it. They don't have to intuit your internal state and figure out like, oh, did was that courageous? How do they feel? No, the next time someone says something to me and I feel scared, I'm gonna tell them that I'm scared. Great, now we have a clear what. By when will you start doing this? Next week, what day? Monday, great, by when? So this is a really simple example that I'm offering you, but if you wanna see how this resistant, get out of here. Uh, hold on, I gotta put the do not disturb mode on. Where do I find that? It's up here and then do not disturb for an hour. Okay, great, we did it. So. For a bigger example, it might be something like someone says, you know what, it's time, I'm gonna get a new job. This coming year, I'm getting a new job. Great, by when? Well, I don't know, I need to figure out, like I gotta figure out my resume and I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Yeah, all of that stuff's gonna happen. By when will you have the new job? So we're standing for you to put the date down before anything else. Everything else you backfill behind the date. What that does is it forces your hand. It takes away your ego's ability to put a whole fuckload of process in front of you actually getting the thing done that's scary to get done. So for a coach who's new, who's like, Adam, I really want paying clients. The first thing I would probably be inclined to, I might you know, have some conversation with them, but really the first thing that I wanna know is great, by when will you have your first client? Well, I don't know, like I got to do my website, I got to do my business card, I got to blah, blah, blah. By when will you have your first client? Once we have that, then we can start to backfill. Okay, great. So what are you going to need to do before that? It's really confronting for people to do this, especially if the thing that they are making a declaration about is scary, which is to say it's outside of what they're already reliable, predictable for, and know how to create. So it's a forging into the unknown. So what Andrew, hold on, let me slow down. If all someone did as a coach was stand for people to make powerful declarations like I've just modeled for you. What, by when? Very clear what, very clear one, when. If that's all that coaches started to do and they really stood for that more rigorously in the face of people's resistance, people would create more. There'd be some other stuff that would get stepped over, but like, I just wanna be clear that this alone can change your life. And we have a lot of resistance to it. So this is the first step for any project, any commitment, any result that a team, an organization, or an individual is attempting to create in their life, we need to create declarations. This is what I'm gonna create. And then we want mini direct declarations from that, like milestones. Great, 10 clients by the end of this year, five clients six months from now, three clients three months from now, and by the end of this month, I'm gonna have one client. 
So now we've got the markers. We've got declarations set up. Let's see what happens. So now we're going to get into what Andrew's talking about. Let me just read what you've written first, Andrew. Andrew's saying, my coach right now has been making me declare a date for when I'll have my next coaching client. Oh, your coach sounds like the worst. She sounds awesome. And I know her, so I know she is awesome. I absolutely hate it. For me, I'm trusting that my action will be enough and has been really confronting to actually say a date. Thanks for sharing that, Andrew, because I think it's easy for people to hold this like, oh, oh yeah, I could see how that might be kind of confronting, but like you're actually in, you're in the lived experience of being with your confrontation. I, I don't know. I just want to trust and allow it to happen, which is fine. But when we simply trust and allow things to happen, what we're likely to create is what we're reliable already to generate. When people just want to, I've seen this a lot when in conversations about flow, where people are like, you know what? I just don't want to make any declarations. I'm just going to allow stuff to happen, which is 100% fine, right? This is not a criticism of that. But what then happens is they they stop making any kind of declarations in their life. And so when you just allow life to happen, what you're going to get is whatever amount of life your current present context currently allows to happen. So hopefully, Andrew, you'd be generous enough to let me just kind of speak into what you shared. And if not, let me know, <laughs> clean up the mess. But you know, Andrew's saying, like, I just want to trust my action will be enough. He, it will be enough to create a client to the extent that he's reliable to do so already. So if Andrew is, let's say, reliable, based on what he already knows to do, to create a client every two months, we're just making numbers up, then just trusting that he's it's going to work out and whatever, he's predictably going to create a client every two months, which is awesome. But he wants something more. I'm asserting and assuming that's why a declaration matters because at that point, now we have to confront, we have a marker in the ground. We have a, a line drawn in the sand that forces us to say, Hey, how are you doing as far as getting to this result is concerned? How's this going for you? So this is the part that's confronting. And this kind of comes to the second part of Andrew's question. Like I'm missing these targets. They seem reasonable. And in the end, I feel like, what's the point? Well, I'm already in the action, so why bother set targets? It's going to happen anyhow. When we set a line in the sand, a couple of things happen. First of all, now we have something to base our progress on beyond how we feel. So what a lot of people want is like a declaration like, I don't know, I just want to feel more engaged in my life. Okay, great. Like, what will that look like in practice? I don't know, I'll just feel that way. Okay, and by when? I don't know. I just want to trust like I'm going to do the work. Okay, great. So here's what's going to happen predictably. Every time we check in with them, we have no marker for their success. And so when we check in and say, hey, how's it going? The only place they really have to look, there's a few, but like I'm going to take some liberties here. By and large, where they have to look is, well, did I practice this this week? Like, how do I feel about this? Oh, I feel good. Yeah, I woke up and I'm feeling good. I feel like I'm practicing well. And I looked at my calendar and I can remember there was a person that cut me off and I said I was generous to them. Yeah, I think I'm making progress. Or, ah, uh, you know, there's a person that cut me off and I fingered them and, I'm, and I woke up and I'm feeling kind of crappy. I don't think I'm doing very good at this, Adam. I really, can we get some coaching on this? <laughs> yes, <laughs> here's the coaching. By when and what is the thing you're gonna create? That's the coaching. That's the thing they're missing. Because otherwise, all we have as a marker is their feelings. And you, like I have probably noticed, you can go to bed feeling top of the world and wake up feeling like a bag of crap and nothing has changed in your world. All that's changed is the mood you're in. So that's part of the gift of a declaration. So now let's talk about the actual crux of Andrew's question. What's the point of setting these if we get to them and we didn't achieve them? They seemed reasonable and yet we didn't achieve them. Now I just feel like a failure. So people create a lot of loops to avoid being loops like workarounds to avoid being with this feeling we're describing here. Uh, I got to the finish line and I didn't succeed. That sucks. I hate myself. I'm judging myself. I'm not going to keep doing that. People reframe a declaration or a goal. They'll call it an experiment or an impossible goal, something 
that's designed to not have them confront the feeling of not doing what they said they would do. They'll just stop declaring anything altogether because then they don't have to really confront that moment, right? It takes it away from them. So this is an example of us contracting from life or doing a workaround, which is the same as contracting from life. They're all ways of avoiding some of what shows up in our life. We're avoiding that feeling that shows up when we make a declaration and we don't fulfill on it. In order to transform, you must, to some extent, fail at your declarations. If you are trying to declare, if you're trying to create a result outside of what's predictable for you, and you make a declaration and you just achieved it, well, that would be kind of weird. Like, maybe that to me suggests you were already reliable for that declaration anyhow, or, hey, sweet, the universe aligned and you just happen to hit the right stuff at the right time. But more often than not, and especially if you're willing to practice ongoingly, you're going to discover that anytime you're going for a result you're not yet able to create in your life, a transformational result, inevitably there's going to be failure points. Not points that measure, that point out that you are a failure, just points where you don't achieve what you said you would achieve. You fail to hit that declaration. And the gift in those moments, if you're willing to confront them, confront them meaning like be with them, sit with them, the gift in those moments is they provide an opportunity to take a look and be like, okay, we didn't, we didn't hit it, team or Adam or whoever. What had it go this way? Where did we go off the rails? What stopped us from achieving this? What was in the way? What did work? All of these questions become available only when we have a declaration that we get to and then are forced to take a look. When you take away any kind of declaration or just like, I'm going to trust the action, I'll do the action. It's not a criticism of you, Andrew, but I, I trust that's not how it's landing either. But like when people do any of those workarounds to avoid having to make a declaration, there, there's nothing to measure whether you succeeded or not. And consequently, there's no space created. There's no clearing in which you could then take a look and see like, how didn't I fail? Because you've taken failing off the table. And by doing so, you eliminate your ability to really take a look and to see like, well, this I think did work, but I didn't really achieve that. Couple more things. Um, I'm going to talk about the workarounds, like some of the stuff that I see people do to, to, or one of the other sides that I see people do to avoid this failure thing. And then I'll talk about like working with this in yourself. So one thing that happens is people just say, fuck it. We're not hitting our declarations. Let's just stop making them. That's kind of like saying, um, I'm an Olympic sprinter committed to gold. I I'm going to train such that in four months time, I can sprint the 50 meter dash in 10 seconds. I don't know what these days is probably like two seconds or something, but who knows, whatever it is. And then I try to do that and I hit that mark four months later and I fail. And, and then it's like me saying, you know what? I'm just going to train and I'm going to trust I'm going to do my best. Uh, I don't think that that's going to get you to the Olympics. I mean, it might, it might. There's always the possibility that it might, but now we don't have any way of measuring how you're doing. I don't, I don't even want you to use a stopwatch because that just gets in my head. I'm just going to, well, your goal is contingent on a stopwatch. So for us to measure your progress towards that goal, we're going to need to use a stopwatch. So letting go, whatever, we're not going to use them. That doesn't really work. The other thing that people tend to do when they don't meet their declarations is they just remake the same declaration without really looking at how it went the way it went. So it's kind of like, uh, I said I was going to do it this time. It didn't. And then they just sort of double down. It's like the thinking is kind of like, if I could just white knuckle harder, maybe, then, then it'll work. So same result, and, and then they'd be the exact same way. That doesn't work either. So we really have to kind of have the declaration, be willing to confront the feelings of failure that will show up, seeing them as the path to growth, learning and transformation. And then once we arrive there, rather than just saying, fuck it, I'm just going to, I'm going to do it again, whatever. I don't want to look at how I suck. We have to be willing to like, okay, move past those feelings or sit with those feelings and then they'll move past you. That's actually how it works. And then great. What had it go this way? What worked? What didn't work? Those sort of questions. That's how growth happens. 
So, um, finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about developing this capacity in yourself, but I'll read what you wrote first, Andrew, which is, it's definitely made me think that my progress to get those targets did not work. Seeing it not as a failure, but that to hit those targets is going to require a different relationship to actually achieve it, different relationship or way. Yeah, that's the gift of a declaration is it, it gives us a mirror and that mirror helps us see, hey, what you're doing isn't working. We don't like that because what if, if everyone was able to really speak honestly, the thing we would say when it comes to like new results is I would like to create a new result without having to do or change anything about myself. I would like to create a new result without having to face my fear or anything like that. We are desperate for that. It doesn't work. It's an illusion, a chimera, a myth, but that's what we really want. Hey, Jess, nice to have you with us. Um, but that's what, that's what, so that's what we want. And so that's why we don't like a declaration because it says, hey, doing everything the same way is not working for you. And then consequently, that's also why we're like, okay, fuck it, I'll just make a new declaration that's the same one. Okay, great, I'm good, let's go. Can we talk about something else, coach? That's kind of like the mirror puts it in front of you. You're like, I'm just gonna put the mirror another hundred meters down the road. I'll, I'll, there, I did it. So it, it's hard. And so in closing this topic, I wanna share that all of what I've described, right? The capacity to make a declaration, to then check in with it, to not let it just be something you said once and then becomes vapor to confront what's going there, to take a look at what's showing up for you, to see what worked and what didn't, all of that stuff. Hey, Sachko, nice to have you with us. All of that process requires time often. It's not free. It requires transformation just to empower that process. So for many people, when they first start working with me, especially, I find this a lot with entrepreneurs who have a real knack for like, trusting their gut, improvising in the moment, which is great as an entrepreneur because you have to pivot a lot. And they're already pretty high performers. So them just doing the action they already know to do, they're reliable to create some pretty good results. Of course, they come to work with me because they want to create a transformed experience of their life and of the results they're able to create. So even though they're already reliable to create pretty good results, there's something beyond that that they want they're often very resistant to the idea of a declaration. And their resistance shows up in a myriad of ways, as, as it does for all of us. But usually like early on, the first part of our work is just for them to be willing to make a declaration and empower the declaration they've made. Meaning they say it, and then they don't just immediately bury it in the ground. They're like, they say it, and then they hold it, and we talk about it every step of the way. For some people, this is their process, like six months with me. And this is what we do. I had a client who for the first, we were in a year long coaching relationship. And for the first six months, this was largely what we were talking about. And the way that conversation would manifest in our coaching is that he'd come and go, Adam, I really want to make sure I get the most out of our coaching. I'm feeling like I'm not like, I'm not getting as much out of it as I could. And I'd be like, great. What is it? that you wanna make sure you leave with by the end of our time together that would really have you feel like you got the most out of it. That's a form of inviting a declaration on his part, right? In a year's time, I'll have this. Couldn't do it. Or put more accurately, was so resistant to it. Ah, well, I don't, I don't know. First, he didn't know. And then, ah, I don't really wanna do that. And so we spent a lot of time looking at like, what was underneath that? And ultimately there was like this feeling for him that he didn't want to make a declaration and then fail at it. He was really confronted by this idea that like, if I don't say I'm going to do something and I don't achieve it, that I can be with. But if I say I'm going to do something, if I really declare it and I fail at it, well, that means that's proof that I'm never going to get there. And so that's what we were really up against. And so as you be in the practice of learning how to make declarations, to fill on them, to like empower them and empower the structure and confront those feelings of failure that we've been trained by society and by parents and guardians who loved us, as you do that, you're really excavating a lot of this stuff. So for anyone that's sort of like, fuck, why don't I have, like Adam laid it out, it's so clear, why don't I already have this? It's because that's part of your work. 
And over time and getting supported and being in transformational structures, you'll become more and more able to really do what leaders do from a quality of being, which is make declarations for people. You'll be like, ah, I really need to get my team sorted out. I need to make sure that our policies are clear and I need to blah, 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 blah. So I'll get back to you when I know that's going to be. And that doesn't work as a leader because people need to be able to rely on us as a leader. And so our job as a leader is to make a declaration by when we're going to have that worked out and then do the stuff we have to do to get it worked out. And that allows other people to really be like, oh, got it. Okay, I can rely on Adam. And then there's other parts of this. Like we have to, if we have given our word, i.e. a declaration, and we discover, oh, I'm not going to be able to make that, we have to bring that to those people, clean up any mess it's made. Hey, we're not going to be actually able to meet this. So da-da-da-da-da. Ruth, Ruth saying, ah, this all resonates with me so much. I either don't make declarations or don't reflect on why I haven't achieved one that I do make. So I don't have to deal with the feelings of disappointment and carry on doing the same stuff. Ruth, you're already taking steps by distinguishing that. And then the next step is be in the practice of making declarations and stepping past that. Now you're in the forge this coming year. So you're going to get a lot of practice with this because we stand for you to do exactly that and to be with everything gets, that gets driven up. <clears throat> great, great topic, uh, Andrew. Really love that. Okay, Brita asks, how about how to keep a healthy and calm mindset when life starts to get busy? I just want to check and see, did Bay message me? I don't think she did. She looked like she was trying to, no, not yet. How do we keep a healthy and calm mindset when life starts to get busy and she follows up and she says, I find it so easy to live well, keep a great mindset, hell out the window. <clears throat> great, uh, great question, Brita. So the first part of this is um, a lot of what we think of as transformation, why has my live video been interrupted? No, we're back. A lot of what we, oh, I better stop my computer backing up. Let's just make sure we do that. Oh, back, oh great, it's not going to. A lot of what we think of as transformation is, is um, captured in what Brita's described. Oh, I've created this ability to be calm and peaceful in these circumstances. So imagine someone's like, I really want an experience of peace and calm in my life. And then what they do is they go and create all of the circumstances of their life such that they are able to be peaceful and calm. So that might be like, this job's really stressful. I'm gonna leave it and I'm gonna go to this job over here. The place where I live is really stressful. So I'm gonna go over to the beach and live right there. So now they've created this life that looks kind of calm and peaceful and they're like, breakthrough, I create a breakthrough. See you, Ruth, have a good swim. I'm looking forward to the fall with you. So now if we looked at their life on the surface, we'd be like, oh, wow, look, they have created the breakthrough. They used to be stressed and freaking out and now they're calm and peaceful. Oh, so nice. What they have created is they've arranged and managed the way life can show up with them. Meaning they've managed their circumstances, they've managed the people that they connect with, and they've managed the situations they allow to enter into their life so that only those that they can currently be calm and peaceful with can show up. So this is what most of us, if the possibility of your life is transformation and breakthroughs, this thing we're describing is what most people settle for. We think it's a breakthrough. We think it's transformation. It's not. And I'm going to explain why. Well, who am I to say what a breakthrough is and is not for you? But it's not the transformation that opens up possibility that people usually believe it to be. The reason why is that what that is about when we're making our life molded and stop, I don't like these kind of things, so I'm going to stop that. That's a game of contracting from life. It's a game of managing the amount of life, which is abundant and infinite in its possibility. It's a game of managing that so that only the parts we can be with can show up. And so you may get to live a life that is peaceful and calm, provided 
that only certain aspects of life come to you. And so while your experience in that life will be a certain way, peaceful, calm, happy, joyful, love-filled, whatever you want to call it, the amount of life that you can be with is shrinking over time. And because life's abundant, it's going to find a way to get through the cracks. Even if you do find like that perfect deserted island, oh, fuck, now there's crows here and they're cawing. Ah, okay, I got to find a new cave where there's no cawing crows. Because as you contract from life, your ability to be with life, the muscle you have to be fully expressed and at peace and all of that stuff with life contracts. It atrophies. Just like if you don't work out your bicep, your bicep shrinks. And so what happens is your ability to be with, ability to be however you want to be with the abundance of life shrinks. And that then means that even more of life attacks or reduces your ability to be peaceful and calm, which then has you contract from it further, which then has the muscle shrink even further. So this is why people's energetic bigness, it's why like the, the presence, the, the, the resonance of someone's energy shrinks as they age. For, there's many other reasons too, like physically our body breaks down, we're mo like everything in, in our body is dying, but energetically what's happening is we're shrinking because we are contracting from life and we can be with less and less and less of life. So that's the, that's the um, underlying context for what we're talking about here, which is that <clears throat> why can't I be this way around this stuff and how do I be that? Now, Breed is asking this question from what sounds like the context of a breakthrough, which would be rather than eliminate all the places where life is busy, so that I can be peaceful and calm, how do I create myself as peaceful and calm in the presence of busyness? That's a much more expansive game, right? So if you are like, I hate neighbors because they make me angry and I can't seem to connect with them, so I want to live out to the countryside, nothing wrong with moving out to the countryside. But what would be far more powerful would be to create the breakthrough around your neighbors first then move out to the countryside so that you're not moving out to the countryside to escape some part of life you can't be with. Rather, you're using what's showing up as an opportunity for your own growth and development and then moving to the countryside. And then when neighbors do show up or you happen to find yourself in the city or in a hotel, you can still be with all of what life has to provide. So this is the distinction. Come back to me, camera. Focus up on me right here. Get this, get this guy. This is the distinction between what a transformation actually is and what we settle for, thinking we've created transformation and breakthrough. Worth noting, most people come into coaching wanting that, that um, pseudo transformation I just described. I wanna figure out, help me leave my job to find a job that makes me less stressed out. So there's nothing wrong with that. I don't wanna vilify that because that's where we have to start. But then what a skillful coach, someone, with the art of transformation available, will work with you to help you to, to distinguish not just that you want a new job, but also like what's the underlying experience that you're hoping to create? And then they can start to look with you to see where else in your life are you lacking that experience? So you can start to see the, wor the work to be done more deeply as something internal, as well as the shift outside of you, as opposed to just, if I just change my circumstances, then everything will be different. Okay, so then we come to the heart of Rita's question now that we've set up all the scaffolding, which is, okay, fucker. Okay, Adam, but what do we do? What do we do to stay busy and calm in the midst of all that? How do we work with busyness and, and all of that? So the first thing for me, the first thing for me is that <clears throat> I learned that when I'm, let me just see if I can get the right distinction here. When I feel confronted about my performance or my value, getting really busy is often the solution. So like, as long as I was busy, you know, doing homework, playing soccer, like busy though, doing shit, then that meant I wasn't going to get, <clears throat> excuse me, reprimanded, 
I wasn't going to get called lazy. I wasn't going to get told to get back to work or any of that sort of stuff. So being busy had a safety for me, especially in contexts where I was particularly vigilant of feeling lazy or whatever. And so from that context, if you were to put me in places that were particularly prone to point out laziness or critique or um, where I felt particularly vulnerable or like I wasn't of value, so either where my fear was particularly confronted or where people were particularly to provide the same training, the default for me to step into was busyness. You can probably see then from there how, um, I guess a good word would be like magnetic and seductive the legal profession for, would be. I don't know how many of you are lawyers, probably not a lot, but that doesn't matter. You've got an experience of lawyers, which is like you sit down with them, your time is blocked out to six minute intervals and like they manage to somehow often fit like, they, they can be really nice, and but there's like a sense of time being very strict and managed and it's tight and they're very busy. And the profession as a whole is incredibly busy. There's a, a dramatic amount of overwork in the legal profession. So what that provides is a really seductive place for me and the legal profession to meet each other. First of all, I'm already really good at being busy because I've trained myself that way because it alleviated my fears and addressed my confrontation. So I kind of have a predisposal to being good at being busy. I've, I've managed to play that game really well. And then the legal profession has a need for people to be busy. It's set up. That's the, that's the current of that profession. It doesn't have to be. It's just the way it's been created. So then we just fit together like lock and key. It's a perfect fit. Add to that that lawyers are really brilliant people, people with a lot of high powered brain power. You know, you're basically sort of solving mental problems and logic constantly in that career and thinking very quickly on your feet. So it's a real fit for brilliance. When you're around brilliance, there's a real risk of feeling stupid or like you're not doing enough or being lazy. And so when you see other people busy, what do you do? Well, if they're busy and I'm not, what does that say about me? If nine out of 10 people, if you were to just look in a room and you saw nine out of 10 people that were super busy and one out of 10 people that wasn't, that looked relaxed, your assumption would predictably be that person's lazy rather than nine out of 10 of these people have a problem with busyness and being overworked. So there's like a cognitive bias. There's a current that pulls us along. So when we are confronted with that, we, we go along with the current. That's what there is to do. The simplest example of this for me was when I was in law school, there's 108 people in my cohort. And these were like A-type personalities swimming very quickly in a stream, all going in the same way. And I, for some reason, and thank goodness, but for some reason, felt the call to a different direction. And so I turned midstream. During my third year of law school at the start, I was like, I'm going to do something different. I'm still going to be in law school, but I'm going this way. When you do that, a whole bunch of fish belt you in the ribs. They're not doing it intentionally. It's just they're in a current. And so as you turn, you get smacked a whole bunch. And that tells you, like the way we translate that is, oh, there's something wrong. So... All of this to say, busyness is something we learn. It's a pattern that we learn. Now I wanna be clear, there's times when it really serves us to be busy. Well, let's distinguish being busy from um, being very focused on getting things done. Because I can be very focused on getting things done without the experience of being busy. So I'm gonna distinguish those two. There's a real gift to being focused on getting things done and, and sort of putting my energy into something and maybe even working some extra hours. The problem that I'm seeing kind of in what Breed has asked is when it stops being a choice. I don't have the capacity to choose like, does it serve me to be really busy right now? Mm, no, it doesn't. Actually, what's gonna serve me right now in this moment is to go for a walk. I'm gonna go for a walk, that'll feel really good. So consequently, what we're really looking at is your ability 
to choose busyness, to choose being really focused on getting things done, as opposed to just getting locked into this state of automaticity, this like, fuck, I got to be busy. I got to get all this stuff done. So the way we learn to develop that muscle is first, we just notice how we just notice ourselves being busy. That's the first step. Usually what happens is we notice it like either in the moment and then it's gone and then we're pulled back into it. Or we notice it like at the end of the day when we're like, I am zapped. So part of the practice is noticing it as it's happening. So that instead of like having the wave come, hit us, drag us up the beach, pull us back down, and then we go, damn, that sucked. I got wailed by that wave. We kind of want to be riding the wave as we're like, oh, it's happening. Oh, here we are. So that's the first practice is to develop the ability to distinguish, oh, I'm creating some business in this moment. The second thing is to start to ask ourselves, we don't have to do anything yet, but to ask ourselves, does it serve me right now? And to get that answer, we have to go below the level of the surface answer. And the surface answer is the one that's going to come from your head. Your head has a reason why you already need to be busy. And so the first answer you'll get when you say, when you ask yourself, does it serve me, is going to come from your head. Does it serve me to be busy right now? Well, I've got to be in court tomorrow. This has to happen. Blah, 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 blah. Yes, it does. Okay, back to being busy. And nothing will ever change from that place. So as we start to ask ourselves this question, this reflective question, we have to recognize one, the head's going to have a preset answer. Your head is designed to run the algorithms that allowed you to get here. Your heart is the part of you that sort of like has a deeper wisdom than the brilliance of the mind. And so from there, the actual journey is, does it serve me to be busy right now? And your head's going to be like, and you're like, got it. Thanks, head. Glad you're on this journey with me. Set that aside. Does it serve me to be busy right now? If I set aside all of that, do I feel in my body that what would best serve me in this moment is being busy? And as we, this requires some slowing down, which already busyness is in competition with. So we have to kind of like be willing as a starting place to set aside busyness for 30 seconds, if we can do that. And if we can set aside for 30 seconds, then we can sort of check in and be like, what does my body need is a great place. And usually when people are in the throes of busyness, you know, their posture kind of gets down like that and they're doing a lot of work really quick. Usually when we're in that space, what really serves us is like, no, what would serve me is going for a nap. What would serve me is reading. What would serve me is eating an apple. What would serve me right now is going and taking a walk. And our head has a million reasons why not. Your head is going to defend the status quo. That's the job of your brain. Your brain's job is to work to some extent in concert within the existing paradigm. And the existing paradigm includes you being busy. And so we have to slow down and we have to ask ourselves those questions. And initially, if all we are able to do is start to hear the voice of our heart telling us, no, it doesn't, it, not right now. What would really serve me right now is to go for a walk. If you can do that and hear that voice, and then you go, fuck you, I got to work. And then you work, that's growth. Because now you're at least hearing a deeper level of truth in yourself. And you're giving your, and then you're, now you can really be at a level of choice that wasn't there before. Before you ask a question and it, it comes here and then your head processes it and spits out the predefined answer. And so there's no real choice. Does it serve me to do this? Yes. Okay, great. There's the choice I make. That was easy. But now you actually do have a choice. Oh, my head and my fear and the part of me that's designed to mitigate for my fear says, yes, it does serve me. But actually underneath that, there's a deeper truth starting to come forward that I can hear, which is actually it doesn't serve me. And what would serve me is to go for a walk. From there, you can start to make a new choice. And for a long period of time, or short, depending on how long you resist your own truth, I still have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this. But every time from here forward that you choose something you feel you have to do in competition with what you know on some level is your deeper truth, it, it forces a, um, what's the word here? Not reconciliation, but it's an, a, a, or it forces a reckoning. You're forced to notice how often you're choosing a path different than your truth. 
And there is something profound and beautiful that will happen as you do this, which is that you will start to notice more and more the cost every time you choose something different than your, your deeper truth. And as you do that, you're going to start to be less willing to do so. This is scary because remember the the thing we should do, the thing our head directs us towards is the thing designed to protect us from our fears. Your heart often, the path of your heart often lies through your fears. So as you start to take on this reckoning, you're going to start to be like, fuck, I can't keep doing this. And yet I'm terrified to make a different choice. And this is the part where we walk through the eye of the needle. We, we cross the hot coals. We reach a point of courageous commitment to self where you say, fuck it. I can't keep denying this part of me. I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to do that thing that I know is my deepest truth and I can hear it. And then you do it and you face your fears. And maybe like the groundhog who sees his shadow, you run back and hide for the next three months and you keep going with should. But from then on, things will start to grow. So what I've described is kind of like a bit of a, a model for how transformation unfolds. A coach supports you in doing all of this much faster, but it can come to you on your own terms as you go through it as well, provided you're willing to listen. And I want to be clear that sometimes we're just not willing to listen because it's too scary because we're too worried of that reckoning, because we're too afraid of what we will then do if we really start to, to pursue the path of our heart. And so for some people, we just stay locked forever. It's safer to not hear the voice of your heart because it's going to allow you to stay inside the context that your head is, is keeping present for you so as to protect you from your fears. And that's not wrong either. It's just part of our human conditioning. So little more than just a simple tip for how to stay calm and busy. But I think, Brita, thanks to your brilliant question, that provides a lot deeper um, cut of what's actually available and how we can move through this in a way that would transform us rather than simply allow us to like white knuckle through the moments when life's busy. That's not the game that we want to really play. Let's see what you have to say, Andrew, and then we're going to wind down. Um, there's a lot of satisfaction. Andrew says, and being busy, and we're praised for that, for hard work, putting in the hours. Yeah, our culture is geared towards busyness. So it's important to recognize that's the dominant current. So if you aim towards choosing a life that's not busy, if you, if you were to um, spend a day kind of on my shoulder or in my head even, you'd notice there's a lot I do and there's not a lot of busyness. Now, I still get busy when I get confronted, but I have so much more capacity to be with more of life that my that default I was sharing where I'm like, jump into the busyness, that's just, I can choose outside of that so much more. And so it's so much less present for me. So I get a lot done, but I'm not often very busy. People are often like, oh, I know your time is precious. It's not. I mean, it is. Everything's precious. But I, I, I don't, um, I have an abundance of time available for people. They may have to schedule a few weeks out because I have a commitment to like honoring what serves me and the people I'm with so I can give them all of who I am in the moment. But that's not an indication of my busyness so much of my commitment to something beyond that. That being said, given that the dominant current of society, at least here in the West, is one of busyness. If you're busy, you're doing good stuff, you're to be rewarded, you're a hard worker, you're blah, 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 blah. As you start to create a life like the one I've just described for myself, you may notice one, that you will have opinions and fears and thoughts about being the fish swimming across the stream and people hitting you in the sides. And you may notice that other people have thoughts, opinions, judgments about what you're choosing. And until you've resolved that for yourself, their opinions and judgments are gonna trigger yours. So that's part of the work. And then Andrew, you say it's a tough gauge to have as you find that you could pretty much work the entire day without checking in to the self-care that might be needed. Yeah, we need, it, it can be really helpful. We don't need anything. It can be really helpful to have diagnostics for ourselves. So I was, I was getting a massage. I go for a weekly massage at the school. There's a West Coast College of Massage Therapy, West Coast College of Massage Therapy. So it's great. You can go um, as long as you don't mind getting a massage, it's not quite as professional. In some ways, it's more professional because they go through an assessment and everything, but like they're students. So they're not as good as like a professional 10 years in, but it's only $40 for like an hour. 
that's pretty good. So I go for one of those every week. And I was talking to the student the other day and she was giving me some stretches for my pecs. And she was saying, you know, often we don't experience our pecs as tight. What we experience is that the down the midline of our spine, the scapula, we we feel that feels kind of crunchy and tight. And that's a good indication to stretch out your pecs. So having these kind of diagnostics are really helpful when it comes to things like checking into our self-care. Your breakdown in self-care might not occur like a light bulb that says, hey, have you taken care of your self-care today? It might be like, oh, I notice I'm getting really irritable. Or I notice my posture is really hunched. Maybe that's a diagnostic for me. Or, oh, I notice I haven't drunk water in like eight hours, or I haven't eaten any meal other than one meal today. So these, we, we, I like to use those as diagnostics rather than a checklist to make sure you do. The gift though, is that if you're sort of like, I really benefit from eating three meals a day, and then you're tracking that and you notice that you're not eating three meals a day, the opportunity is not to then white knuckle and be like, fuck, I gotta eat three meals a day. It's to notice, oh, I think my self care is getting out. And maybe what there is for me to do is to step back from the busyness and to actually like take this on and so on and so forth. So creating diagnostics for yourself that kind of help you recognize or identify or distinguish when, oh, I might not be honoring my self care can be really valuable. I'm trying to think of any of mine. Um, so one, hi. Uh, I, I want to stretch my pecs too, Adam. Like they're, they're actually, t they are tight right through here. I was doing push-ups and chest presses and stuff the other days, feeling them. Um, diagnostics for me are one, if I notice I'm, <laughs> if I'm playing a lot of video games and getting very impatient or annoyed that I'm losing at them, that's a really good diagnostic for my self-care. Like, oh, my well-being's a bit out because I start to get, myopic into the game and winning or losing the game becomes significant instead of like, who the fuck cares? <laughs> it's a fucking game. It's fun until it's not. And then I do something else. So that's one indication for me. Um, if I notice I haven't been outside for like a couple of days. So working from home, it's very easy for me to wake up, exercise here, come to work, sit in front of the computer, play games, eat dinner, go to bed, if I haven't gotten fresh air on my face in a couple of days, that's an excellent indicator that, oh, I might be neglecting my well-being. Um, let me see if there's any others. Those are the two biggest ones I can think of in this moment. But those don't have to be yours. Whatever there is that sort of serves to like just, oh, oh, yeah, there might be something for me here. Those are really great to have. Uh, Andrew says, or you could go to the physio for injury. You could. Yeah. If your back starts to feel crunchy, go to the physiotherapist. Okay. Um, we're down to just a few people. So I think we're going to wind down there. Um, let me just see if there's anything I want to plug or share with you. We still have three spots left in the forge and we're in conversation with about five, I think even more, actually, there's a few names I haven't put up there. Um, so if you're, um, on the fence, if you're like, hey, you know, I've resisted reaching out to Adam about a conversation with this, but I kind of like if that part of your heart is sort of saying like, I think you should talk to him and your brain is like, don't talk to him, fuck it. And you want to be in the practice of just honoring what's showing up in your heart without necessarily having to do anything about it, reach out to me. I'd love to have a conversation and who knows, maybe it's a conversation that's like serves you two years from now where you're like, oh, snap, I want to do this. But um, this is sort of the point where we're in a lot of conversations about this structure because it's life changing. So if you'd like to do that, send me a message, reach out to me. Um, I, I'm going to show one other thing that I'm creating here that uh, that will be available. This is like a I guess we could call it some merch, which is kind of neat. So um, I've I created a document called the principles of service, which are there to help you get clear on how do I serve someone? Not as like a set of things you must do, but a set of guidelines to support you so that you don't get, here's what often happens. People are like, 
uh, I, I want to offer this person something or like, I think they want to work with me, but I think they're scared, but I want to serve them, but I'm afraid. I'm, ah, and we get all in our head. So I created this document called the principles of service. If you don't yet have that, you can send me an email and I'll, uh, you can write me adam at adamquani.com, or you can message me on Facebook and I'll send you the, the PDF of it. But I want something more, more cool. And so, um, I've, I've found a way to get it created as an ancient scroll. So um, it comes, it's gorgeous. It's got these, you know, the edges are kind of weathered just like an old timey scroll. It's got this walnut wood. I'm not gonna open this because it's actually a different scroll but you can like un unfurl it out and it would look gorgeous on a wall. It's got really cool fonting. It looks all old timey. And um, there's something about uh, this, to me, which really, um, there's a reverence to something like this, to a document printed this way, everything about this. And I hold service as a way of being in, in great reverence of those that we are in conversation with. And so this feels like a really beautiful way to honor your practice. If you're someone committed to service, it looks great on a wall. It's absolutely gorgeous. And um, kind of like a cool reminder, if you're like, man, these principles are great, but I don't like having a PDF on my computer doesn't work. You can kind of put it on your wall, put it in your kitchen, whatever. So I'm in the process of setting it up on our website, my website, so that you can just purchase these from them and it'll be on demand or you can give them to people or whatever. I don't have that yet, but I just wanted to show you how badass this looks, how cool it is. It'll be a different color. This is a different uh, particular scroll, but I don't know what the colors will be yet. But anyhow, it's going to look gorgeous. It's really neat. I'm super excited about it. So if that's something you're like, man, I don't even care. I just want that scroll now. Hook me up. You can also message me about that. I'm happy to send the PDF for free. And if you want something a little cooler, a little more like uh, spiritually reverent, then you can let me know about that. And um, and when those become available, just at, like on demand, I'll make sure I share that with everyone. I just want to read what you wrote here, Jess. Great call. A diagnostic list was my biggest takeaway. Thank you for the gifts you share. Thanks, Jess. I really appreciate your, um, I'm honored and I really appreciate your gratitude and your acknowledgement. Um, Adam, Sam, Jess, uh, Rachel, Katie, Ruth. Uh, who else do I want to just give a shout out to? Anyone else? Uh, Kristen, LA. Um, thanks everyone for coming and hanging out. And um, a big thank you, as always, to the people that provided topics, David, Brita, and Andrew. Um, if you ever have a topic, you can just message it to me on Messenger. You can email it to me, or you can wait. Thursdays, I always put up two roll calls for topics, requests for topics. You do me a tremendous service. And providing a topic doesn't mean you need to be live. You don't even have to watch ever again. So if you're sort of like, man, Adam's cool. I wish I could contribute to him. That's a really great way to contribute to me. You probably don't even know what a contribution it is, but anytime I get to be on this journey with you in partnership, rather than generating it all over here, that's a contribution. So thanks to the three of you, Andrew, Brita, and David, and thanks to everyone that posts and provides uh, comments. It really makes this way more fun. Have an amazing weekend, guys. We'll catch you soon. Bye-bye.